please let the record reflect that all council members are present. And I will read the determination here quickly. Um, council chair determination to hold electronic meetings without anchor location in accordance with Utah code 522074. I have determined that conducting meetings of the Ogden City Council with an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present due to the infectious nature and potentially dangerous health effects of contracting the COVID-19 virus. This determination is based on the following. Utah has been in a, declaration, in a declared state of emergency due to the novel coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, since March 6, 2020. The World Health Organization has characterized the spread of COVID-19 as a pandemic. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has determined that COVID-19 is easily spread between or among people who are in close contact with each other through airborne respiratory droplets and may be spread by people who are non-symptomatic. Federal, state, and local health authorities recommend limiting public gatherings, wearing face masks, and following social distancing guidelines that those exposed to individuals, that those exposed to, I'm sorry, that those exposed to individuals experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 self-quarantine for 14 days, and that individuals experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 self-isolate to prevent and control the continuing spread of COVID-19. Physical distancing measures are difficult to set up and maintain in the city council chambers. Based on the foregoing, all public meetings, including work sessions and meetings of the Redevelopment Agency, will be held electronically through August 31st, 2020. Information on how to connect to the electronic public meetings will be posted on each agenda. The public may comment during the electronic meeting, during public meeting, public hearings, or provide public input on items designated for input on the agenda. General public comments will also be taken during regular meetings. Written public comments may also be submitted through the following electronic options. Telephonic message at 801-629-8158. Public comment submission form at ogdencity.com forward slash public input or email at citycouncil at ogdencity.com. This statement is issued and becomes effective August 3rd, 2020. Thank you everyone for your patience with me reading that. Now, um, we've asked Vice Chair Blair to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So I think that Brandon will put up the flag. <clears throat> we appreciate that. Thank you. And then I would ask all council members and anyone else who's joining us to please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Are we ready? Ready. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Chair Blair. And I ask that you would just join me in a moment of silence. Okay, well, we'll start this evening um, with the approval of minutes. So we first have the work session of February 18th, 2020, and that's Council Member Stevens. Yes, uh, Chair, they're correct. Thank you. And work session of February 25th, 2020, that's Council Member Lopez. Yes, Chair, the minutes are correct. And the regular meeting of February 25th, 2020, Council Member Nadolski. They're correct. Thanks. And the work session of March 10th, 2020, Council Member Heyer. Yes, Chair, I've reviewed them and found them to be accurate. And finally, the work session of March 24th, 2020, Council Member White. Yes, Chair, I've reviewed them and found them to be accurate, and I move that we approve the minutes. Second. Second. 
Thank you. So we have a motion by Council Member White and a second by Council Member Heyer to approve the minutes. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And thank you all for reading those. Um, number four on our agenda is the common consent. We have two items tonight. We have council rules and norms revisions. That's to adopt a resolution as well as the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget amendment um, that is allocating $30,000 for the Spanish language translation services. And this is for setting a public hearing for August 18th, 2020. Chair, I would make a motion that we um, approve the uh, common consent agenda as posted. Second. second. And we have a motion by council member Heyer, and I believe that was the second by vice chair Blair um, to approve the common consent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And I, if I ever get that wrong, please correct me because sometimes when I look away, I can't see whose green box is lighting up. <laughs> Great, so I'm really excited to welcome Lori Buckley, the Project Arts Coordinator, um, to talk with us uh, about the new arts grants. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Um, thank you, City Council members and Chair Jaberka, also Mark Johnson and Mayor Caldwell for having me here this evening. Um, I'm here this evening to discuss proposed resolution 2020-21 uh, that when adopted will award $100,000 uh, in art grants out into our creative community. Um, the arts grant program that the, the city offers helps to support and foster Ogden's vibrant and healthy um, community. And I myself, the Arts Advisory Committee, our local arts organizations and countless individual creatives would like to thank you the city council members and city administration for supporting the arts and contributing to the overall fantastic creative culture that Ogden has. So um, let me share my screen here. Hopefully this works. So make let me know if this if you all can see this. Is it working? Hopefully. Yep. There we go. Okay. So, um, of course, the budget for fiscal year 2021, $100,000 has been allocated for arts grants. Um, your role um, as city council is to make the determination that the value of the programming and projects that um, we're receiving for the arts grants money uh, is equal to or exceeds the monetary value of the grants. This year, 38 grant applications were received and uh, they were reviewed by the Arts Grants Review Subcommittee. And then they were also reviewed and approved by the full Arts Advisory Committee. And they are recommending that 29 of the 38 grant applications merit funding. We have seven general support grants and, uh, that were total $40,000 $40, and 22 project support grants that total $60,000. As per um, the Arts Grants Ordinance, we have a 40-60 split of the funding, 40% needing to go to project, I mean to general support and 60% going to project support. Um, so the general support grants, there's of course seven grants. We had $76,860 in ask and seven of these uh, organizations are being funded uh, for $40,000. And then in project support, we had $150,644 in ask, and 22 of these um, organizations are being recommended for funding. Um, so again, just to recap, we have a total requested support of um, 40,000 for general support, 60,000 for project support. Um, you've all received in your packets the arts grants briefs and, and the review process. And so tonight we are asking city council to, do, to adopt proposed resolution 2020-21 awarding arts grants for fiscal year, which is funny, 2020-2021, <laughs> that is the same. There, I'm sorry, is there any questions? Lori, could you go through the um, 
the recipients just um you you went through them quickly i just think it's i sure can so let me just move this thing so i can see what i'm doing i'm driving around here um okay general support so we have chamber orchestra ogden um Eccles community arts center uh imagine ballet the uh shaw gallery at weber state ofom friends of Ac acoustic music on stage ogden um which was formerly uh what was on stage uh ogden symphony ballet so that's their new name and then treehouse children's museum is there any questions in that line so what makes them a general support so to be a general support to apply under general support you have to be an arts based organization that is a nonprofit okay. so they have to have nonprofit status and their mission has to be an arts based mission so that would be why like the give me a chance um, organization applied in general support but were actually not qualified because their mission isn't an arts based organization they are a nonprofit but um, they should have applied in project support and I did inform them of that. So hopefully next year that their application comes in correctly. And then uh, project support, oops, what am I doing here? Pushing wrong buttons. Yeah, take your time. There we go. So, and then in project support, um, this can be for individual artists projects like collaboration projects or um, an organization that may or may not be arts-based. We have several in here that are an arts-based mission, but some that um, are just doing arts type of programming. And so to be, and actually to qualify for an art grant, it, any of their programming has to occur within the boundaries of Ogden City and benefit Ogden residents. So that's another, you know, another Thing that we have to look through on their application to make sure that the programming and the event is happening in Ogden City. So here, um, the Banning Collective, which is Van Sessions, uh, that happens that happens year round uh, on First Friday Art Stroll. They do a podcast and musical programming. Um, Benjamin Zach Eyes on Ogden. He's a photographer that's doing a project that's focusing on several community members of Ogden and his photographs will be actually printed and displayed around downtown Ogden. Um, let's see, the Boys and Girls Club of Weber Davis, they have some um, arts uh, programming that they have available for the children that um, are clients of theirs that attend the programming there. Um, Gabriel Gordon is doing and hopefully we'll be able to do this. Um, he might have to be doing them outside, outside of the senior centers and have them maybe open the windows, but they'll do concerts at the senior centers in, in and around Ogden. Um, he asked for, as you can see, a large amount of money, but a lot of his concerts were actually not in Ogden. So we had to um, make an estimate of how many of the concerts occurred in in Ogden senior centers and that's as you can see why that amount is quite different there. Um, of course good company theater um, supporting their theater and uh, the theatrical productions that they put on here in Ogden. Jazz at the Station which is a beloved program that happens at the Union Station um, throughout the summer and then we have the uh, Hispanic Festival is being funded this year. Next Ensemble Season of Performances, um, an LGBTQ plus theater performance, Nurture the Creative Minds Day of the Dead, and the Season of Performances by Ogden Concert, Concert Band, um, the Ogden Film Festival, um, Ogden Movement Collective, which is a new application this year. And that is, um, let me see, if I make sure I get this exactly correct, what they're doing. Um, it's a performing arts concert um, featuring community voices in the medium of contemporary dance, monologue, guest performances, and it will be done with Ogden School District students and, and um, there'll be an, 
music performances along with the dance and uh, monologues. So they're planning on this happening in May of 2021 at the Monarch. So hopefully um, by, their, by next year, we'll be able to have pub public gatherings for this to happen. And then of course, Ogden Nature Center's Earth Day. Um, Ogden School Foundation's Festival of Arts, they do this yearly and this benefits about 25, a little over 2,500 students enter this. It's an art contest. Um, Juneteenth Festival, um, Salty Productions Magazine, uh, Tribal Love Dancer, which is African drum and dancing um, that uh, it's, it's actually goes into the local schools and um, Deja Mitchell heads this up and she brings in um, performers and they teach the students about African culture and they get to drum on the drums and learn how to do African dancing. Um, a new one for this year is the Weber Arts Council is doing a playwrights residency where they'll bring in a, a nationally known playwright that will do some courses and do a short play with um, people who are interested in, in playwrights and uh, theater production. And then Weber State Arts Learning is Utah bird, learning about Utah birds and this is something that will be in local schools and it's an art project where they'll be doing um, a project where I think it's like stained glass type work if I remember correctly and it will be installed at, out at the Nature Center. And then Weber State has their Upward Bound program and they're doing a We Are Ogden mural at, um, and it's a small mural that's going to happen at uh, the base, what's the baseball stadium name? Um, Linquist Field? Yes, Linquist, Linquist. And then Youth Impact has a welding arts program for their clients and where they're teaching the students a skill of welding while they're doing a creative project. And so that is all of the projects that we are funding. Um, we had a total request of $227,504 of ask and had to narrow that down into $100,000. So. This is actually a, an image there that of um, the tribal love dancer, African drum, dance and drumming, um, one of the at the, one of the schools. So great! Thanks so much for that overview. You're very Next, welcome. Questions or comments from council members? I have a question, Laurie. Sure. Um, just because these are strange and unique times, I'm just wondering. I know a lot of people have grand plans and it all sounds wonderful, but what if some of these things aren't allowed to happen or, or they don't get to happen this year? Do we, do we check on those things or do we, does that money just roll over or how does that happen? Well, well, normally, like before this happened, we required them to finish their projects and if they didn't, then they had to return the money. But because of the uncertainty of times, and this happened actually for the 1920 fiscal year, I had about seven or um, seven of the grants had to, I offered them an extension on their grant and they had to give a plan of how that, why they're extending, what's the proposed date, you know, because a lot of them are public event type yeah. projects. And so we've offered them extensions on their grants and this grant cycle and the application process actually happened before. So this happened, um, the grant cycle opened in January and closed March, March 13th. So we were in and done with the applications before COVID actually, like before everything got locked down. And so these people also, um, I'll be working with them on helping them to either pivot their program. And that's what a lot of the past grantees did, they pivoted their programming to some virtual programming. So they were able to complete their projects and programming virtually. And some of these might have to do that as well, or we might have to offer them extensions until it, it's either they can figure out a safe way to produce their programming or it, you know, we're out of, you know, the danger of, of infection. Perfect. Okay. I just wanted to know how that worked with COVID. Sure. Thank you. That's a good question. I appreciate your flexibility for that. That's a rough situation. 
It is. And we definitely didn't want to be taking money away from these small arts organizations that, you know, really depend on us for support. Any other questions or comments? When you go out to the schools, do you go out to the public and also the charter schools? Um, they, it depends. Some of the programs do all of the schools and some of them only do, you know, they kind of pick and choose and do a few. So it just depends on each, each grantee and their, and their programming. And a lot of times they have to work with the schools to try to get in on their schedules, you know, to fit in where there's not any testing or other things happening. So I know that that is um, getting time at the schools that's, that's not conflicting with something else is hard for them too. So they do do their best to get in most of the schools. I do know that though. Any other questions or comments? Um, well, before we open up for um, public input for this public hearing, um, I should just mention that, I think I mentioned this in a work session, that there's many grants involved in this that go to Weber State Arts Programming of some sort. And I just need to declare that although my spouse works at Weber State in the art department, none of these grants go to support him financially in any way. So I don't think there's a conflict of interest. I just wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of that though. Okay, so, yes, uh, so just uh, since you brought up the conflict of interest, it's a good time for me to bring that up as well. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm on the board of directors uh, for Lupec and I'm the founder of that organization and they're being proposed to be award funding this year and I think I should recuse myself for that reason. Uh, this is very difficult for me because I'm a very, very, very big supporter of uh, the arts as all of us are. And I always like voting on this item uh, uh, down the road. I don't know if maybe I'll have to talk to Janine or someone and see if there's anything that could happen to handle these different so I can vote on on the whole package, but maybe, maybe not on on that particular item, but it doesn't matter now. I, I'm okay to recuse myself from voting if that's okay. Great, so I think the last time we did this, and maybe Brandon or Janine, you can chime in. Um, you know, you could go ahead and leave the meeting if you'd like to, Council Member Lopez, and then we can let you know when we're finished with the process. Is that what you would recommend, Janine? Yeah, normally we would have him leave the room, so I think the only <laughs> option would be to have him leave the meeting and then uh, we can text him, Brandon can text him, or I can text him when um, it's time to come back in. Does that sound okay? Like so, uh, absolutely. So, you would you like me to uh, do that right now? Yes, I think that would be appropriate. Okay, I'll, I'll be waiting for a text message. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Bye. Great, is there any other comments or discussion? Okay, so I think we'll open um, up the public meeting. Um, I think Brandon will tell people how they could participate if they'd like. Thank you, Chair. Um, for those of us, or for, for those of us, for those of uh, the public that are uh, joining tonight's meeting via Zoom, um, you can participate in the public hearing by using the raise hand feature found within the application. Uh, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that says raise hand. Click on that, we'll get you in the queue and your comments will be limited to three minutes. There's adequate time at this point. 
I believe so. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the folks that are on the list know how to use the Zoom, so I, I feel pretty comfortable. How about you? I do too. And so I think I will make a motion that we close the public hearing. Second. Thank you. So we have a motion by Council Member Heyer and a second by Council Member Way to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Great. Um, so now I'd be happy, unless there's other discussion items, I'd be happy to entertain any motions. Chair, I would make a motion that we adopt Ordinance 2020-21 for the Arthur Grant's fiscal year 2020-21. <laughs> I second that. Thank you. Um, so we have a motion by Council Member Heyer and a second by Council Member Stevens to approve proposed resolution 2020-21. Um, this is a roll call vote. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Council Member Nadolski? Aye. Council Member Stevens? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you. And thank you, Lori, for all of your hard work with all that outreach and helping people learn about the grant applications, and et cetera. Thank you. Thank you all for your support in the arts. We really appreciate it. Uh, Chair, uh, if I could just make a comment. I don't know if Lori's uh, was involved with this, but I've seen throughout the city the, the horses, uh, and uh, that has drawn a lot of interest, uh, not only uh, to the horses, but uh, also to the arts. But uh, I don't know if she had anything to do with that, but it is uh, actually having a great impact in our community. Thank you, um, Council Member Stevens. That's actually a project, um, I think, well, Christy McBride kind of headed it up with uh, Pioneers Day Foundation. It's our, our Ogden Shares Art Programming that we're trying to get some safe public art um, activities out for the community to enjoy. So I'm glad that, that you've noticed and are doing that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Council Member Stevens. Yeah, I just I think it's fun you just suddenly discover someone you're driving around the community, you know, in unexpected places. It's nice. Thank you. Oh, great! It looks like Council Member Lopez is back. That was fast. Thanks again, Lori. Karen, this can I just make a real quick comment? This is like usually in person, my favorite time of the year to. Uh, to be at and so that's why i thank you laurie for going through that whole list because usually they're at our chambers and 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 so i appreciate you doing that um because i just i i, I miss that so thank you i know it's a little bit sad not to see um imagine ballet's little um dressed up in their costumes here to come say thank you it's a little bittersweet this meeting yeah a sign of the times I did um, notice, just as a side note, that um, Good Company Theater just posted some really fun events where they're doing theater. One actor's doing theater in front of the windows, and you can sit up front on the, like, on the sidewalk, not on the street. But um, there's very limited seating. But, yeah, everybody should check that out because it's a limited offering. And, yes, yeah, so they're trying many different innovative ways of getting some art out to the community. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, now Greg Montgomery is the star of the show for a little while um, with reports from the Planning Commission um, with a proposed rezone of 1400 and 1475 West Midland Drive. Welcome, Greg. Well, thank you. Uh, can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay, good. <clears throat> so this is a petition that had been filed uh, by one of the property owners out on 1475 West. Uh, and the request started in December with his individual property, which is in this uh, slide is shown in the uh, uh, red uh, cross hashed area. The entire area that's in the, the light tan color was rezoned to R110 back when the city annexed these properties into 
the city from unincorporated county a couple of years ago. At that time, um, it was determined that this area should have R110 as primarily the uses there had been residential. Uh, when it was in the county, <clears throat> excuse me, there were uh, kind of a mixture of some, uh, some this various uses, but the, uh, the property owner had, had bought this property since it became in the city with the intent to do a contractor shop there. And only when he found out that it was actually his own residential uh, did he then come to us and ask for a rezoning. At that December meeting, the Planning Commission uh, determined that not only should his property be considered, but the uh, entire area is zoned R110 ought to be reviewed. And so the meeting was continued to Dece to, from December to January in order to contact other property owners to see what their concerns were. And those property owners uh, contacted the city between December and January. And uh, in this uh, photo, you see those who contacted us saying they were in favor of their properties also being zoned M2. These were five of the eight property owners. <clears throat> and so as the planning commission looked at that, they felt it'd be appropriate to take this entire area and rezone it to M2 at this point, rather than have piecemeal applications. The uh, reason why the commission did this is originally they felt that because of the constant uh, items that had come to the planning commission as properties around this neighborhood developed, uh, people concerned about protection of their homes, but they were in the unincorporated county and we really didn't have any zoning standards that, to protect those homes. So it was zoned when, once it came into the city, R110. However, <clears throat> since that time, those properties, many have been changing hands and they've always been advertised as manufacturing properties. And then the, the people were surprised once they had bought it to find out, no, they really weren't manufacturing. So we feel that it's important to look at these properties in a whole, uh, to now determine that people are really buying these properties for the intent of manufacturing purposes and to honor that intent to rezone this area to M2 so that there'd be a continuity of development all the way along Midland Drive. Um, there have been some buildings built that were first, some had been permitted by Weber County before the annexations took place. Uh, one had built a, a pole barn, as you can see in some of these photos, that was under construction when this discussion was taking place by permit from the county. Uh, the applicant himself uh, had uh, both the house, but he also had some other outlying buildings that would lead to, to a manufacturing idea. Um, this kind of gives you an idea, of course, this is back in December, January, when these pictures were taken when the commission was looking at this, but kind of the feel for the area, but it really is an area in transition. And so the commission felt this was in compliance with the general plan. Uh, that because the actual uses are going to be taking place on the property, perimeter buffering was no longer needed because the uses were really going to be manufacturing. And so uh, the character of the area is generally manufacturing. And so rezoning that all the property uh, to M2 uh, was appropriate action. The commission voted 7-0 to recommend approval of that rezoning. Any questions or comments for Greg? Uh, Chair, did we have Greg review what can go onto an M2? M2 is our uh, heavy industrial. So about um, any type of manufacturing use can go in there, uh, whether it be uh, contractors, um, storage, um, uh, salvage, junkyards, auto, body, all those types of uses can go into the M2. You know, to the, uh, to the um, northeast of these properties right now, you have uh, 
uh, a construction contractor's yard that does uh, asphalt and other things. Um, further to the to the uh, south uh, southwest, you have recycling. You have um, a variety of things. So it really is a heavy industrial use area. What can't go into an M2 there, M2 zone? Well, we don't allow, allow hazardous materials. Uh, we don't allow um, transfer stations. We don't allow uh, certain uh, chemical productions. Um, but but it, a lot of a lot of variety of things can go into M2. And the surrounding area is all zoned M2. So it's not like this is a, on a boundary of something different. Everything around it is M2 zoned. Any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Um, we could open for public input if there's no more comments. Great. Um, so, Brandon, I don't know if you would like to repeat how people can participate if they'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, if you would like to participate in tonight in any of tonight's uh, um, opportunities for public input, um, you have to be joining us through Zoom. And um, by using the raise hand feature, which is found at the bottom of the app, you just tap or click that and your um, hand will be raised and we'll be able to see it here. And then we can uh, let you address the council for three minutes about the topic of conversation. I always like to give a couple extra seconds just in case. It's very hard to read a crowd when all you see are names. Okay, if there's no more discussion and no public input, I'd be happy to entertain any motions. Chair, I'll make a motion that we uh, adopt ordinance 2020-32. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Heyer and a second by Vice Chair Blair. And this is a roll call vote. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Heyer. Aye. Councilmember Lopez. Aye. Councilmember Nadalski. Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is for Greg and Montgomery to report to us um, about the proposed zone text amendment for the design standards of small accessory structures in East Central plan area. Okay. Thank you, Chair and members of the Council. So what we're looking at here is a, a recommendation from the Planning Commission regarding a, a, an amendment to uh, the East Central Standards. Now this actually encompasses three zones, the R15, the R2EC, and the R3EC. And it's that area uh, highlighted in red, uh, known as the East Central area between the, the brow of the hill to the north, 30th Street uh, to the south, Adams generally to Harrison. Now, when this area was created, <clears throat> there were certain design standards that are unique to this area and those three zones that do not apply to other areas in the city. 
And that is because of the designation of the Central Bench uh, National Historic District. And so it's trying to create some special design standards that would respect the architecture and the character of the area and in terms of building design, materials, and sizes of structures. So one of the requirements is that presently, uh, buildings have certain material requirements, uh, new construction to help uh, blend with existing buildings uh, that may be on properties. Those design standards in, related also not only to the main building, but to the accessory buildings. And what we were finding out as people came in to do their land use permits, they had already bought at different places, whether it be uh, Lowe's or Home Depot or Tough Shed or, or wherever, pre-manufactured accessory buildings. Now, I know there was a question in the work session. These are sheds, basically. This is not accessory dwelling units where people live in. These are buildings that are used to just store things in. They're not garages, uh, they're not ADUs, but they're, they're sheds. And the, the ordinance and building code have that if something's less than 200 square feet, a building permit's not even needed. And so people would, would acquire these structures and then find they're not meeting the design standards of the zone. And so as they came in, we'd inform them that uh, you really can't put that there, but they've already bought it and already had it coming in. So here's an example of what people would buy. And the variations of why they would not comply would be because either the material maybe had been a vinyl, uh, maybe the, the lines of the material were vertical rather than horizontal, all things that are characteristic of these central area, but in these pre-manufactured little sheds, uh, those are the typical designs that, that take place. So as the Planning Commission looked at this, they took into consideration a couple factors. First, the small size, the fact that they're not an item that requires a, a building permit per se, so they generally are uh, pre-built. Uh, they're always located in the rear yards behind the dwellings and the dwellings generally screen them. And so there's little visual impact to the buildings. Um, and so the commission uh, considered that and those are the same questions for the council to consider is do these accessory buildings in the rear yards detract from that integrity that was desired with the East Central community? And does that square footage minimum uh, of 200 square feet or less uh, seem a reasonable balance between what the owners are trying to accomplish to use their properties without impacting the character of the area? So the ordinance proposed added additional materials for these, these small accessory buildings and removed language of the orientation of the, the siding that had to be vertical. It could, I mean, it had to be horizontal, could now be vertical. It could be vinyl, it could be resin, stucco period material. Uh, it just could not be galvanized uh, bare metal. Also, the, the, the roofs could have that, that galvanized metal or the the vinyl, uh, again, what's typical found in some of these small uh, sheds. The location was discussed, and again, they're behind the building, but on a corner lot, the same standards that apply for other uh, detached structures that would also apply on a corner lot. It had to be 20 foot back uh, on that side street face. Again, so it's more behind the building and doesn't have as, as great as visual impact. Uh, or be put to the far end uh, away from the street in the, in the rear yard. But that helps. Hey, Greg, may I ask a question? Yes. So just to make sure then, so if it's not a corner lot, then uh, it's code that these uh, structure will have to be in the backyard? Yes, there, there'd have to be in the, any accessory building has to be in the backyard. Okay. Got it. But, but this is just saying that it could be, if it's that area you talked about, anywhere in the backyard. It wouldn't be 20 feet back from property. It could be anywhere in the backyard. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay. 
And so the Planning Commission recommended uh, nine to zero to, to make these amendments, showing that this uh, was an appropriate revision to help address concerns that people have when they're trying to get a little storage area in their yard and uh, still retain the character of the central and not adversely impact those character defining features. And any um, questions or comments for Greg? Sure, I did, I did have a question. Greg, if you could go back one slide on that, uh, the, the first one on the left, the first uh -huh. diagram, that, that's showing 20 foot from the side yard setback. Is that meant to be that, or is it is it anywhere in the rear yard, or is it gotta be 20, 20 feet away mm -hmm. from the side yard setback? It's 20 feet away from that side yard setback for that accessory. Okay, I understand. Any other questions? Okay, well, we can go ahead and accept any public input on this item if no one else has any comments or questions. I think that it's all the same people on the line, so um, I don't think we'll repeat the how-to. If you'd like to comment, you can go ahead and raise your hand. Well, I don't see any um, hands raised. Um, so if I were to make any public input as a resident of that area, I would say I'm all for it because I might accidentally already have one of these in my backyard. But that's just a true confession. Um, but I'd be happy to entertain any motions. Chair, I'd make the motion that we adopt Ordinance 2020-33. Second. So we have a motion by council member Heyer and a second by vice chair Blair to um, adopt ordinance 2020-33 and this is also a roll call vote. Council member Lopez. Aye. Council member Nadolski. Aye. Council member Stevens. Aye. Council member White. Aye. Council member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye, and that passes. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least, Greg, you're up again for the proposed zone text amendment for the reduction in minimum size of townhomes in the mixed use zone. Okay, thank you. This is a petition that the city received from uh, Lotus Development uh, they are presently working on, on the projects uh, between uh, Grant and Washington on the uh, north side of Park Boulevard. And as they uh, were looking to do development uh, of townhomes, uh, one of the things that they came up against was the present provision of 1,300 square foot minimum for all townhomes. Uh, the concern with the developer at this point is the market forces have changed and that to have every townhome at 1,300 square feet uh, did not meet the needs of what some of the market demands are. And so the uh, proposal was to then make an amendment to create a variety of housing types that still could be townhomes but could meet different income levels and different needs of individuals and not have to just meet one type of the townhome design. So the request from the applicant was uh, to reduce it, uh, to have a minimum of 940 square feet. Uh, they had proposed a certain number of units of five units. Um, as, as the discussion took place at the planning commission, one of the things that uh, staff had said is that to, to just have a, a number 
may not get the mix that you're looking for. So we had talked to the commission in our presentation that this revision should be for up to 25% of the total development units. That way mixes could occur and there they could have options and choices for people in the types of um, places they, they live. It preserves the quality of the development. It also allows that flexibility to be stable. And again, it helps increase the, the market of those projects and uh, helps create some creative floor plans. People may be looking for different things. This gives them those choices. And it really does not affect the overall aspect of what we're trying to accomplish in the MU zone. Uh, as as made, mentioned here, it's parking neutral. A larger units uh, will have the same parking standards, but in reality, there may be some additional parking that can be created uh, because some of the smaller units may not have as large parking demand. One of the things that was used in the discussion of this was some market studies, one done, done in 2013, that looked at uh, what bedroom sizes uh, being 639 as an average. Also, Another study was followed up in 2019 showing some of the bedroom sizes increasing, the one bedroom size increasing, um, but still below the 1,300 square feet uh, that we require in the present ordinance. This is an example of the developer's proposal of townhomes along uh, Grant and, and Park Boulevard. And you can see in the right, uh, that smaller unit uh, placed in with the other townhomes that most people wouldn't really pick up on, but it would be smaller and it would allow some options in terms of what people may need. We looked at the compliance with the general plan in this revision saying this is still encouraging downtown development, it's diversifying our housing types for different ages and incomes. It helps us to again have more housing occurring downtown and helps to make these projects success, successful without impacting the overall urban design. And uh, so we felt this was consistent with the, the plans, the, the general objectives, and, and also in compliance with the river project. Again, it was, gives a mixture of housing types, uh, that variety, and the smaller units can meet different needs and still have the adequate parking needed. So the Planning Commission recommended 8 all to approve this petition. And as Glenn had mentioned in the work session, uh, discussions of the last work session, the petition really talked about uh, single bed, um, one bedroom units. We don't have that provision in the MU ordinance. We just say, here's the size. It's up to the developer how many bedrooms he wants. So we felt it was also important here to say, here's the square footage. 25% of the units can be this square footage and let them choose whether it's a one bedroom or two bedroom this of this size. Great, any questions for Greg? I don't believe the developer has joined us, but they, they were with us during the work session and answered quite a few questions. So when you downsize, Greg, do you decrease the quality of the product? No, you don't. Um, in fact, some of the things that take place are, are maybe some upgrades to, to attract people into those units. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So Greg, just as a question about kind of process, um, after we make this decision, do we also see a development agreement from this developer or is it already in place and it doesn't come to the council? Yeah, this would not because these properties are all privately owned. There wasn't any RDA switches or changes or exchanges that took place as part of this project. So uh, the site plan I showed you is what the Planning Commission has looked at and uh, has approved just subject to the ordinance being amended. Thank you, I'm just curious. Yeah. 
I know some neighbors there are really wondering what's going to happen on that property and are excited for something to be developed. Yeah, in fact, maybe just to, let's see if I go back here. Just... Yeah. So anyway, you can see how this occupies that area of the, the townhomes. Um, we can't see your screen. I'm sorry, Greg. Oh, okay. Just a second. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, it does. Okay, you see that area here? So you have the townhomes. Mm -hmm. So here's Grant. Here's the River Parkway. Here's where the Ogden Brewery is taking place right now. <clears throat> and there'll be a walkway that this lines up with a walkway through the townhomes now as a public walkway to the river. That will continue on as a separation between the townhomes and the commercial developments taking place here with another river access that's to be a public walkway through here also. So this project will have penetration that public can get to the river from Park Boulevard and not have to go all the way down to Grant and then back. Great. Thanks. Okay. And if there's no more questions or comments for Greg, we can go ahead and open and um, receive public input on this item. I see one hand. Angel Castillo, uh, you're the first to comment. Please state your name for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Good evening, council members. Uh, thank you for your time. I just wanted to, uh, oh, Angel Castillo, sorry. Um, I just wanted to voice my support for this reduction of uh, square minimum square, maximum minimum square footage. Um, as a matter of fact, I would even encourage the council at future dates to consider even smaller units because um, as you all know, I've been extremely concerned with housing attainability in our community and part of the developers pro forma is making things work. And while not LIHTC financing or um, specifically lower income housing, smaller units are germanely cheaper. And um, many cities are considering uh, micro units. And I, especially when you're working with a developer like Lotus, that has a reputation for building quality products. Um, I think it's important that we look at that and make sure that we can allow developers to build what makes sense for them, provided that the quality of the exterior and the units remain the same. So I strongly encourage you to support this reduction of uh, property for the, uh, excuse me, the uh, minimum square footage, because it's going to help us with our housing attainability issues that we're looking at in Ogden. Thank you. Thanks, Angel. Any other public comments? I'm not seeing any public comments, so unless there's more discussion or if anybody would like to propose a motion. I couldn't think of the words. Chair, if you don't mind, I'll make a motion that we adopt um, proposed ordinance 2020 34. Second. I have a motion by Councilmember Heyer and a second by Vice Chair Blair for um, adoption of proposed ordinance 2020 34. This is also a roll call vote. Councilmember Nadolski? Aye. Councilmember Stevens? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Lopez? Aye. Vice Chair Blair? Aye. Chair Chaburka? Aye. And that passes. Thank you. And thanks so much, Greg, for all of your time this evening and your preparation. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Now we have time for our public comments. This is an opportunity to address the council regarding any concerns or ideas on any topic. Um, we certainly want to make sure we're considerate of 
everyone at the meeting. And so this public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. And we ask that you state your name for the record after you proceed in the, yeah, after you raise your hand. Thank you. Amy Wicks, the floor is yours. Please let me, like Chair Chaburka said, please state your name for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Hi, Amy. Hello, thank you. Amy Wicks, uh, Ogden resident. I am uh, again here to encourage you to do your jobs. You've just given yourself raises, um, earn that. Um, hold administration accountable for taking care of important city functions like recycling. Um, if, if they can't um, make it work, then they need to take the cans away because essentially people are getting an additional free trash can. Um, asking citizens to continue to sort their recyclables while they are being sent to the landfill um, is, is kind of offensive. It's absurd, you know, why, and I get that it's a good habit to be in, but, you know, we're smart people. We can get back into the habit, and I assume that when or if the recycling program is resumed, uh, it may look a bit different, and we may have to do some education on what can and can't be put in those cans anyway. So, um, you know, don't offend us by telling us to continue to waste our time sorting our recyclables when they're just being picked up and taken to the landfill. Uh, I would like to encourage the city council to look at our refuse rates. And if you are not going to figure out in a timely manner or have administration figure out in a timely manner how to resume the recycling program, I would encourage you to look at our rate structure that we pay for refuse and reduce it, uh, it along uh, the lines that we are paying for, we're paying for recycling services and we aren't receiving those anymore. We are uh, now having to take those things somewhere on our own and uh, we shouldn't be paying for those things. And if you aren't going to be providing uh, recycling services anytime soon, then maybe you should consider picking up the blue cans so we're not storing them and so that citizens are not getting uh, a free additional trash can. So I would encourage you to continue to look for solutions give administration a deadline to deal with it. You can't just kick the can down the road, so to speak. Uh, COVID-19 is not an excuse. You don't have to visit these places in person. A lot of people, you're doing Zoom meetings right now. If that's appropriate for a city council meeting, that's appropriate to figure out if um, some sort of system would work for our city. So um, please do your jobs. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. I don't know if administration would like to come in on that or we tell later. I can cover that through the comments in a minute. Okay, thanks. Heath uh, Sato, your uh, the time is yours. Please state your name at the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Um, hi, thank you. Um, Heath Sato. Um, I would uh, like to echo some of Amy's comments. I, would, I was hoping to hear an update about the recycling um, this evening. Um, I was also disappointed that uh, Councilman Heyer did not issue an apology for his flag stunt at the last um, city council uh, meeting. Um, I was pretty upset about the divisiveness of that and I would like to hear him explain that if possible. Um, and lastly, um, I've heard on three or four occasions the mayor um, mentioned that he has no say in whether or not we have uh, uh, require masks and, um, and that it's up to the governor. But the governor wants city leaders to ask him for permission to do to, for mask requirements. And um, I don't believe he's asked. Every city that has asked has been granted permission. So I just, I don't know if the mayor's confused or, um, or what. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that for everyone that, that it is up to the mayor um, 
to ask the governor for a mask requirement. It is not solely the governor's um, discretion. Um, and that's uh, all I wanted to say. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Any other public comments? Angel Castillo, the floor is yours. Please get your name for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Hi, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, I just wanted to put in the city council's ear that we really need to strongly consider what we're doing with regards to ADUs and the there's an impending ordinance that is uh, for C2, C3, which basically is going to limit or abolish multifamily housing in commercial districts. And while I understand <clears throat> some of the city's motivations behind that, we need design standards. That's very important. We wanna have good solid development. Um, my biggest concern is if we're limiting residential multifamily, which traditionally um, helps ser serves lower income families and that you know over 50% of Ogden is renters, we wanna make sure that we're providing multifamily use along a transit line. And so I, I'm gonna be reaching out to council members with a, a longer explanation of, you know, and links shared to other cities and some data about how important that is. But we're, we're at a critical time right now as we continue to grow that we need to make sure that we are enabling developers to build quality, affordable housing and, and allow people who own property to fully exercise their property rights and build a pathway to financial wealth with regards to uh, renting to family members or with regards to ADU having, uh, you know, the ability to let people age in place. So it's, it's an extremely important decision that's going to be coming down the pipe. I know you don't take it lightly. Um, and I, I look forward to having conversations with each of you to hear your views and to look at this conversation, how we're going to continue to provide housing affordability to the citizens of Ogden. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comments? I don't see any other hands raised, but I do want to acknowledge I really appreciate those of the diversity commissioners that are attending. We appreciate you participating. <clears throat> okay, so now um, I don't believe the mayor's on the call, but uh, Mark Johnson, would you like to make comments? Thank you. Mayor Caldwell is actually taking his daughter to back to school, so he's um, in, on his way, I think, back from California, but he's not here tonight. Um, a little history on recycling. I was on the city council when we started recycling back in 2002. We never, we decided not to actually put any money towards recycling. Our hope was that recycling would actually pay us and actually pay for the program. It did for a number of years until recycling uh, became non-profitable uh, with the city used to actually get a pretty sizable check that actually paid for the recycling piece. Uh, since uh, recycling hasn't paid much money, we have actually been subsidizing it out of just the regular fees. Um, we were recycling through the county at the landfill for many years. The county discontinued recycling, didn't tell any of the cities about it. Uh, we were in a mad scramble what to do with our recycling. There is one company in Ogden that recycles, and that is a company called Recycle Earth. Um, they are located in a place that is a little difficult if they actually dump um, outside the buildings because seagulls come, the neighbors, it's in an, in an industrial park area. The neighbors have gotten quite upset with the smell, the garbage, the seagulls, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> this company went to the Planning Commission to get a conditional use permit to be able to do recycling and construction garbage. The Planning Commission, when they issued the conditional use permit, had several requirements that 
recycled earth needed to uh, achieve. They have not achieved those and we found that they were um, even more um, blatant at not uh, fulfilling that and so we stopped temporarily taking things to them because we didn't feel like the city should be taking um, re uh, recyclables or anything else to a company that was not fulfilling the conditions of their conditional use permit. Since um, then, we have discovered just recently that in the last year, they haven't even been recycling our stuff that we've taken to them, that they've been taking it straight to the landfill. Um, we've had a meeting with them uh, recently to discuss, one, them getting in compliance, which needs to happen, and two, what would they charge us in order to recycle? And they're coming up with those numbers. Those numbers change monthly. We're, we're supposed to be getting those numbers from them for the last year, which we'll attach to our tonnage and get an idea of what it would have cost over the last year had they actually charged us what they needed to and then actually recycled what we've been taking to them. Our hope is that we are back recycling soon. Um, if they don't comply soon with the Planning Commission's conditional use permit, it could go back to the Planning Commission and they could uh, withdraw the conditional use permit. The only other two Northern Utah um, recycling opportunities, one's in Logan and one's in Salt Lake. Uh, considerable distance to travel, but we are actually pricing those two um, um, agencies also to see what the price would be. And then we will be coming to city council and to the public and saying, here are our options, here's what it will cost. And um, our hope is to be back uh, recycling as soon as possible. Um, I think that both uh, the meeting was very productive with Recycled Earth and us that we held this past week. Our hope is that we can have the analysis to you in the next week or so, and then hopefully be back and actually recycling the, the um, product that we're collecting and taking. Um, that's um, a brief summary of where we are and what we're trying to do. Hey Mark, um, can I ask, I mean a lot of other people have asked this too, is there a way to update the website or sure. give some communication to folks so that, you know, when they're a lot of people, and I apologize, but not a lot of people read the paper, right, or, or get this news. So I think some people are kind of hearing wind of this and then they're kind of trying to figure out for themselves what to do. So I wonder if we could put a message. We I mean, will do that. We'll do yeah. that tomorrow morning and we'll, and we'll keep it updated as we go. Yeah, I've even tried to refer We're not trying to throw the vendor under the bus either. And, and I don't want it to sound that way. They were a little concerned that they've been being thrown under the bus. Um, and that is, I'm just trying to give you the straight facts of where we are and why we're doing what we're doing. I think, I mean, to be frank, I think that that's what a lot of the constituents want. They just want to know what's happening, um, you know, minute by minute, so they know what to do with their recycling. Because a lot of folks I know are doing their own collections now and, you know, trying to do their own services, so. And, and like I said, our hope is that we are back recycling quickly. And it's dependent on those two things. One, price, and, and will everyone be okay with what that price ends up being, and two, are they in compliance with what the Planning Commission has um, given them for their conditional use permit? So, I, uh, Mark, just real quick. So you're telling me that we don't really charge for recycling? We don't charge for the blue bins at we never, all? We never have. And I think that, that's a lot of uh, constituents' concerns is if we're not recycling, then, you know, um, we, we, like I said, I remember when the decision was made, I was on the city council at the time, and the decision was that we thought we could make enough money, and back then you did make money on recyclables, and we thought we could make enough to pay for the program and not charge the citizens for it, and so we never have charged. Um, I guess unofficially, since we don't get any recycling checks anymore, we kind of are subsidizing, which in, in effect, I guess the citizens are paying for it, but, um, you know, it, we kind of absorb the cost instead of um, raising the fees for um, for garbage. Chair, if I might uh, ask a question also. Um, 
in the interim, since we really aren't, uh, none of the trash is going anywhere but the but the, the transfer station, wouldn't it make some financial sense to, to only put one garbage truck on every street every week instead of two? I, uh, I think that would be fine if that's what uh, individuals want to do. I think, um, uh, you know, like I said, I think our, our people in uh, refuse are worried uh, because it's taken a lot longer than has been represented tonight to train people how to recycle and what to recycle. And I think their fear is, is we'll, lose, we'll lose the ground that we've gained. But um, I, that's certainly up to an individual whether they want to put things in two cans and take them out or one. I guess my worry is um, if someone starts using their blue bin for other purposes, then and we don't know right when the change is going to happen, it'll contaminate that whole load, right? If it they would. Put waste in there it would. Or it would. I don't have any other comments than that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair, if I could just make a, a couple of comments, and I think maybe a, along with with um, with your pricing with other agencies, I, I actually do agree that maybe not having the blue cans available would be optimal. And I know that, and and because I think we're going to have to recycle differently. I don't think we're going to be able to take everything. So if you took the can away and then brought it back and said you can only recycle cardboard it, and or aluminum cans, you know, I think that might help us with our recycling efforts. Um, so if you could have the refuse guys take a look at, guys and gals take a look at that, that might be optimal. We, and, and we also would look at the man hours that would take. And it, it, like I said, if we can get this back on the road, uh, back going again in the next week or two, do we want to spend the man hours it would take to pull in all those carts? I mean, that's, we, we probably pick up trash from 26,000 homes. A, a week, and that's a lot of picking up carts and, and then re-delivering them again once we get the, this worked out. So we could take a look and, t and tell you, give you an estimate of what we think that would cost. I guess we could, I mean, I know that they put like notices on the bins. I don't know, we could do a noticing on the bin, you know, that would take a lot of man hours too, but at least it wouldn't be collecting them all and then bringing them back out. I wonder, and I guess I wonder too, and I, I'm not trying to over dwell on the issue, but I wonder if the Sustainability and Natural Resources Committee would have any advice, um, you know, about helping with this issue in, in general. You know, I know there's a lot of options out there for what we might do in the future. Maybe we'll have an immediate solution um, that maybe would cost more, maybe transport, you know, transporting to Logan or Salt Lake or something. But I, like Marsha is saying, I think, you know, it's probably a bigger issue than just this one thing. Um, I guess that's just my wondering is if they, they could be helpful at all. I, I will recommend to Jay that he, since he's the staff that works with that committee, that that, that be on their next uh, agenda. Yeah, I mean, I know in other communities I've lived in, um, you actually pay, yeah, you pay like for a tag for your trash and you don't pay for the recycling. And then there are really strict regulations in some communities about how you have to separate it before it gets picked up. So, you know, it's a possibility that community members would be willing to take on some of those responsibilities even though it's a lot of extra effort. Yeah. Great, any other comments about that? No, I would just like to say that if, you know, uh, maybe an update to our staff within a week or two, you know, I, I guess give you a couple of weeks, but I, I think an update would be optimal so that we can at least have a better idea of what we need to do. Um, and, and what we can tell the constituents. I think we're all just kind of trying to figure out what to do. And so an update to our staff and leadership would be great. We, yeah, we'll do that. And I'm hoping we have pricing from uh, the other two locales and we'll also have the pricing of what it will cost to actually get them to um, recycle. And then we'll be back in front of you probably in a work session where we can talk through it. 
That would be great. Yeah, I think a lot of people are just confused now about what they're supposed to do. A lot of misinformation out there. I, I hear you. I, I hesitate when I separate my house right now and myself. So Mark, do you think two weeks? You, you think we'll have pricing by then? I, I'm positive we could do two weeks. That'd be great. Chair Chabarca? Yes. If I may, I have a, another question related to recycling. Sure. Uh, so uh, it's a question for administration. Just if uh, if they if they could address the question about the masks that was asked in the in the public comments, please. I don't know that I can answer for the mayor on this. I, I, it was our understanding that the governor looks at requests from the local um, leader and also the health department. Um, and our health department isn't recommending mandatory mask. And so I think that the mayor felt like that the governor probably wouldn't um, react to that. And I, you know, it's, it's odd, but we get as many phone calls about against masks as we do for them. And I would say it's almost 50, 50 and so it's a difficult subject. Um, it's 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 unfortunately not about health anymore. It's about it's a pol political subject. It's it's where I, I think it's ended up. So I think we're analyzing it similar to what the governor is. Our 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 number of cases has gone down similar to what the states has gone down. So our hope is that people are wearing them. There's a lot. Most of the grocery stores and stores now are requiring them. To go in and I've noticed a big difference when I've gone to the store so I don't know if that answers your question council member but um, I, we think it's a little more involved than what was represented to when you go to the governor in my day job I think that you're correct um, Mark is that it would probably be a joint letter between the city and the Weber County or Weber Morgan Health Department I guess it just depends on if we've asked the health department if they'd be willing to do it too. Sorry, Martian, I didn't mean to cut you off, Councilmember White. No, I just, is there a way to find out what that is? I, I think that would be, um, it seems like there's a lot of misinformation. So if we exactly knew, that would be. I, I agree. I, I second that, um, uh, Councilmember White. I, I would love to, if someone could please help us find out. Um, I understand, I understand, I completely understand that this is, has become political, and, it, and, and I agree that it is very unfortunate. Uh, but it, it's still a big problem and a big issue, and, and I think that our responsibility is not to be political about it, but to be responsible and listen to the experts. And if I remember correctly, uh, not very long ago, uh, there was uh, an email that came out from the health department uh, that was showing studies, scientific studies that were actually advocating for the use of masks, uh, as showing being very uh, uh, being effective in reducing the transmission of COVID. So I, I know what's happening in the political landscape. I just hope that we can ri uh, we can uh, rise above that. Uh, and, and just get some answers. Let's just get some straight answers and let's just not uh, uh, pass the hot potato everywhere. Uh, uh, that's all I'm asking. I, I get it if somebody doesn't want to do it and if most council members and the mayor don't want to do it, that's fine. That's okay, but let's just get some answers. That's all. In my experience uh, going out, I see more people wearing the mask and uh, BYU did a study on the effectiveness of wearing a mask, and I think there is that information that uh, Louise has talked about. Uh, the information is out there. I suggest that we do a joint resolution between the administration and the council in encouraging to wear the mask uh, at uh, one of our council meetings. So I and 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 council member uh, uh, Stevens, along the lines of what you just said. I also understand the, the difficulty of the subject uh, mandating people to wear masks. I, I understand what's happening again. I want to double down on that. 
So may, maybe it's something between a resolution and something else because re, because resolutions also have no teeth I mean, have have I, I I think our resolutions sometimes are not effective. So I just wonder if we can have a conversation about what can we do as leaders in our community to try and persuade. Maybe it's not a mandate. Maybe it's a strong persuasion. Mm, uh, and maybe is I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's a, a, some marketing. Maybe we have to do something on Facebook. And I know some things have been done, but uh, if if most of us believe that we have to do something, then we have to do something. Yeah. So I I understand, Mark. I understand the the predicament that 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 right. political leaders are in now. I completely yeah, understand, right. and 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 I respect that. But. Yeah. Um, I think it's important anyway. to lead out and, and uh, that, sorry, Councilmember Stevens, can you repeat that? I couldn't hear you. I think it's important for us as leaders to uh, get something going. Yeah, well, to be perfectly frank, I'm one of the reasons I'm reluctant to go back into chambers is that we're not requiring people to wear masks in our building. You know, and I know that we're reluctant to force people to do something like that, but I mean, we can only control the. The areas we can control perhaps you know and that's at least one place we could control right yeah <clears throat> thanks for your mask wearing mark there is a big mask up weber campaign happening right now and um i think we could definitely jump on board with that as well i saw that the mayor was in that video we have jumped on board and we've been promoting the heck out of um, that with weber county mm -hmm. Uh, Chair, could I bring up one more topic? Uh, this is uh, different than what we've been talking about, but I read several emails on the problem that we have in the city that uh, we're seeing excessive speeds on our city streets. Um, I've noticed it uh, even on my street between Monroe and Harrison on 16th, especially on 12th and also uh, Harrison from 12th to 20th. Uh, and there has been reports of, of Washington Boulevard. And so I, I think we need to maybe look at that uh, and see uh, what's causing this excessive speeds on our streets. Uh, in residential, it's 25 miles an hour and most people are, are exceeding that speed limit. Uh, some obey it, but there are quite a few that are not. So that's just as a suggestion for Mark uh, in that aspect there. Thank you, we are working on the Washington Boulevard. We've actually been giving out over a weekend, probably 20 to 25 tickets. Uh, and we've been uh, spending quite a bit of time trying to solve the racing problem on Washington Boulevard. Those of us who are a little older glad that the police didn't put that kind of effort when we were younger, <laughs> racing up and down Washington Boulevard. Yeah. We're finding that people are driving a little faster since the COVID thing. And I've read uh, actually statewide, they're having that issue on the freeways and everywhere else. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we got to figure out how to slow people down. For a while, I think the officers weren't giving tickets because of COVID. They were shying away from pulling people over if they didn't have to. And I think sometimes people figure that out. So I, I will pass on uh, to the traffic division, uh, your suggestions and what you're doing. It's hard to patrol the entire city though, but we are working on the Washington Boulevard issue. We've been spending quite a bit of time on that on the weekends. Yeah, I've also noticed between 12th and uh, 20th on Harrison that there, there is some, uh, it's mainly the bikes uh, that I noticed that are probably uh, accessing the speed in that aspect there, so. Hey, Council Member Stevens, yes. I can also mention, we talked about this in leadership yesterday, and um, Amy Sue is actually looking at kind of what some other communities are doing about looking into some things about drag racing and racing on, on Washington Wall Avenue. So we're looking into it um, and hoping to get some more answers on that to see if we can maybe make some policy changes for that to address that issue. Great. Thanks, Chair Blair. Yeah, because one of our challenges, too, is Washington is not a city street, right? So it's a little bit challenging. Amy, did you want to say something? Yeah, 
No, I I was just if if when Bart made that or excuse me, Vice Chair Blair made that comment if I needed to make any commentary. But yeah, Janine's asked me to do some research on that, so we'll have a lot of good information. Thank you. I didn't mean to catch you off guard. Just whenever anybody pops up, I think they've got something to say. <laughs> Would any other council members like to make any comments? I would like to make it. Are, are we really doing comments now? It's not like we were doing a lot of Q&A before. Um, so. I think it drilled Mark quite a bit. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> that we're on the council member comments. Yeah, a, a two weeks ago, um, when we had our very short special meeting prior to our closed executive session, um, I noticed that the chief was uh, present in our meeting. I knew he'd had a bad couple of weeks, and I and I put up a, a support of the police sign. It was not intended to be against anybody. It was just intended to support our our police chief, particularly in our police department generally. Um, I have had a little bit of an education since that time, and in retrospect, I would uh, not do that again. And I apologize to anyone who was offended by that. Um, I, there was another issue that that surrounded made that kind of wonky or. You know, we, because it was a short meeting, our communications uh, did not have the flag for the the pledge ready. I was a little off guard because it was the third meeting in a row that I was asked with somewhat short uh, notice. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but the, but it was kind of a wonky experience. So um, that was kind of my explanation of of uh, what happened in that special meeting. Uh, two weeks ago, so. Thanks, Council Member Heyer. Any other comments? Here, if the, I wanted to ask uh, on behalf of our neighborhood on the East Bench, there's, with. And I'm sure that there's other neighborhoods in the in the community that are seeing the same things. There's just a lot of uh, people out and about. There's more activity and later activity out in our um, city parks, at least those the one near here. And some of our neighbors are wondering if it's uh, if the city would consider uh, closing the small parking area uh, to Marquardt Park, which is on the far south end of Mount Ogden Park. There's just this really narrow driveway with uh, a really small parking area that's kind of tucked away and secluded and um, the neighborhood's getting kind of tired of watching people come in and out doing illicit things in there uh, throughout the day and in the night through with the obscurity that that uh, area affords and um, it is easy to ask the question as to whether that parking area is even necessary given how much parking we have just across the other side of the field there and so um, I was wondering uh, if uh, uh, Mark Johnson and the team would be willing to consider uh, closing that area off for uh, safety reasons. Hmm. That's interesting. And I, if you don't mind, I'd just like to make a comment to that. We've used that pavilion back there several times, and I know it's really handy for people that need ADA accessibility to the pavilion. I know there's another pavilion down low, but that's definitely one reason because it's always packed back there. But I think there is some, um, you know, some parking there that allows some access to that. I don't know if that would make a difference to some folks that wouldn't be able to access that area anymore. Sure, and I think the pavilion operates under a reservation system, if I'm not mistaken. But if that were the case, then access could be provided, perhaps, to those that are reserving it where you. But uh, <laughs> A lot of the um, traffic in and out of that area is, we'll just say, very short term uh, and high duration, high frequency and short uh, duration. <laughs> I'm going to put a camera in back there. Uh, no comment on that. <laughs> Any other comments? I'd love to a response from Mark or his thoughts on that question. Uh, 
Council member, uh, let me clarify. Are you talking about it being closed all the time unless it was scheduled or are you just talking about a curfew later in the evening? Uh, just some way of keeping the area, yeah, I mean, closed all the time, I guess. Um, some accessibility for our city crews to get in and out for maintenance, I'm sure would be necessary. Um, the ADA issue that uh, council member uh, Chiburka mentioned is, is very relevant, so. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to take a look at it. I'll get uh, our best parks guys to come in and we'll chat and see what we can come up with. I appreciate that. And I know we are, our parks guys are the best, so that, that decision will be in good hands. Thanks. Any other comments? I'm not seeing anybody rush toward their screens. I am assuming that. Well, thank you. And I, again, I appreciate you all. Um, tolerating another Zoom meeting in your life and dealing with all the technical um, aspects of it. I just want to give a quick shout out to Brandon Garcia because his birthday is tomorrow and he helps us to manage all this um, technology. So happy birthday. And thanks to all the staff members that have helped all of this happen um, in this other way than we're used to. Thanks. Happy birthday, Brandon. <laughs> Would anybody like to suggest that we adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Second. I'll do a second on that one. Oh, thanks. A second. Okay, we'll yeah. second. Yeah. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Thanks, Angela. Thanks. Stay safe. <laughs>